See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. What does love really mean? And how important is love in keeping a population healthy? It is very clear in the science that one type of culture begets certain things and one type of culture doesn't. In hierarchical, fear-based cultures, you can't innovate, you don't have good quality, you don't have great patient experience, team members are stressed, and so you have to kind of go where those structures are and just dismantle them so that new culture can emerge. The first year I was here, one of our presidents, he got up on stage during the service awards and he shouted out to 1,100 team members, I love y'all. And the, and the crowd exploded. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. COVID-19 precipitated an avalanche of disruption and crises felt at every level of our healthcare systems and in every corner of our countries. That meant disruptions to accessing and delivery of care, organizational and supply chain disruptions, and brutal workforce crises. It also unleashed an urgency, a courage, and humility to make bold moves in a try everything you can think of, test and iterate, healthcare transformation sprint, one that in crucial, compassionate, and holistic ways, saw nurses lead and fuel. And it's critical that the consequential gains of nurse-led innovation not be lost, that they are urgently shared with leaders, decision makers, and those closest to the problems to be swiftly and confidently ushered into our organizations, adopted in our practice, and benefiting our workforces. And that is precisely the intention and opportunity of one well-researched and authoritatively written report. In this fifth and final episode of our Reporting Power series, we're centering on the Accelerating Nursing Transforming Healthcare Report. Inspired equally by the pandemic's tsunami of anguish and innovation, and published as a collaboration between Johnson & Johnson, the American Nurses Association, and the American Organization for Nursing Leadership, this report, with its stories, data, and timely body of research, brought into sharp focus nurses' pivotal role in rapidly deploying innovations in care delivery, organizational structures, and our healthcare workforce. The report is written with a determination to preserve the advances and innovations and accelerate the transformation toward our preferred, more equitable future, even while we are still responding to the challenges of this pandemic. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, infections and deaths were concentrated in big, densely populated cities and skipped over much of rural America. However, as the pandemic progressed, rural communities, home to 46 million Americans, began experiencing transmission and death rates outpacing those of the urban communities. While the pandemic cast a spotlight on a full range of health disparities, those that rural communities experience are among most vexing and likely to widen as access to care shrinks for a population that tends to be older, poorer, less healthy, and less vaccinated. In this episode, we travel to North Carolina to explore the unique solutions available to rural healthcare systems and learn about the power of love and empathy in building cultures and organizational structures, in delivering care that fosters trust, and investing in a homegrown workforce that is diverse, representative, and ready to innovate. I have so many innovative things I'm doing right now to help our nurses because I can't find any. But it, it's really when you get to the place where it's not about the the metrics right away, it's about the relationships and how you treat people, things change quickly. I'm Julie Kennedy Ehlert. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at a large 
academic rural health care system in eastern North Carolina at Vidant Medical Center, which is our flagship hospital for the Vidant system. It's a thousand bed academic medical center in a town of 90,000. I am strategically responsible for patient experience, but not just patients. And the chief experience officer role is really different wherever you go. So you got to ask when somebody says they're a chief experience officer, like what, what exactly is in your, you know, what's in your bucket? So I have responsibility for the patient experience, team engagement and well-being, equity and inclusion, which I work on with our chief diversity, inclusion and talent officer, workplace well-being and safety. And that's my kind of strategic bundle. So I do the goal setting and the strategy around that. And to be clear, we do that as a team. And then I have operational responsibilities for EVS, uh, environmental services, food services, language access services, hospitality services. And then I oversee all of marketing and communication, including digital for the entire health system. Now, I do have an uh, analytics arm because I'm a a data geek. I love looking at data in a holistic way. So I have an analytics arm that looks at patient experience, team engagement, well-being, all those things. And then I have a design arm, which helps design all the beautiful things that we do that influence patient experience, team engagement, and well-being. Sound, <laughs> sounds like you're an octopus with that many arms. <laughs> well, the, the cool thing about it is it, it appears to be siloed, but our CEO, Dr. Mike Waldrum, his vision of hierarchy and he told me this once i said what's your vision of your like org structure and he took a sticky note and he like drew a cloud and he goes you're in there somewhere the good news about that is that if you don't have hierarchical organizational silos you can innovate so it's kind of a mosh pit vibe so i work really closely with our chief human resource officer our chief medical officer and the chiefs are housed in one suite and all of our officers are next to each other. So that was very intentional because we're expected to have, as our CEO, Dr. Mike says, extreme collaboration. And that is fascinating and gives so much opportunity to do so many unique things. Eastern North Carolina, it's mm -hmm. a rural part of the country. Um, very rural. Yeah. What, what do you love? What do you find endearing? Um, you know, when we think about uh, places where people live, there's a certain part of the landscape and the way of life that draws us to those different parts. What is it about where you live that you love? Eastern North Carolina took me off guard. I did not expect to love Eastern North Carolina. I came here from San Diego. And <laughs> it's a big difference. I know. Eastern North Carolina is a big personality. Um, there's a lot of uh, diversity and there's a lot of unique community vibes. And then the thing that I would say that I find just lovely is because we're a huge health system in a rural environment, you either work at Vidant or your family works at Vidant. Our communities are our team members, are our patients. So that gives this really kind of relational vibe to Vidant that is really joyful and interesting to me. Truly, in some of our small community hospitals, the people, the patients, the team members, the community are all one and the same. And from a marketing and communication standpoint, what that means is that you have to totally rethink your marketing strategies because basically you can just internally market to your team members because they will they are your community so that i love that i love the relational nature of mm. eastern north carolina yeah it's very it's it's very tight-knit and it's generational and people very have a so. connection to the place and the institutions in ways that you don't necessarily get in um larger urban areas yeah, definitely um, so what is some of the you know, with every gift, there comes also a challenge. How would you describe the the challenges that your community experiences? And, you know, when you're when you're thinking about those challenges, who else around the world would understand the type of challenges that a community of your nature has? Well, we have all the normal healthcare challenges, but rural 
America is often forgotten and has its own compounded challenges. Um, a rural environment means that your resources are not close to you. <laughs> so when you think about urban settings where an ER is 10 minutes away, a grocery store is two minutes away, those, those things just aren't us. And so some of the unique challenges have to do with the rural nature and those small communities. People can't get places. People don't have access to things that they need or want. Um, many of our patients, for a variety of reasons, can't get in a car and drive 40 minutes for their health care, and nothing is close to them in 10 minutes. I think that anywhere where there is rural environments, those kind of forgotten places anywhere in the world, these challenges would be the same. And there are certain things that we do really well in medicine now, but they're time necessary. A cardiac arrest, a stroke, having a baby. When you're in an urban environment, you're 10 minutes from a resource. Here, you could be an hour and a half from a resource. And that brings with it a lot of really interesting possible solutions. So one of the things that I really loved about Biden, and I was, because I worked in urban environments most of my life, is they would talk about having like cancer care in these little communities in a six bed hospital. And I'd be like, you have a cancer care? And they'd be like, yeah, we keep everything in the region that we can. It's our commitment to the community and our team members and the family. So very different than some organizations who have a lot of small hospitals that feed the big hospital. We push a lot of our care and resources and health needs deep into the region because otherwise our patients wouldn't have access to them and we would not be honoring our commitment to serve them and love them and care for them. Well, and in addition to being there for them, and we know that when you're sick, you want to be home. But the other part of that is in order for us to be good at anything, we have to do, we have to do more of it. And so when we're not providing that level of care, our teams, our systems, our individuals, where do they get their, their training and their skill and their experience to know something and to be able to care for something, to have the skills and the intuition. So there are many, many, many reasons why we want to um, do our best to make sure that people can get the care they need in the places mm -hmm. where they live. And the quality care that they, that they yeah. deserve as well. When we talk about experience, a lot of what you're doing is culture building. And I think it's an interesting triad of engagement, safety, and quality and how all of those, how those three things really fit together. And you also mentioned the word power <laughs> and hierarchy. Those are some words that have a lot of energy around them. Your approach to creating culture at Vident, I find atypical. It isn't the approach that most people go with, which is bringing a lot of consultants. We're following this method. We're bringing in this level of training. You took a very different approach to that. Um, yeah. Say more. Yeah. So we do have a very different definition of culture at Vident. It's very well known. We talk about it a lot. I think most organizations use the definition of culture of how we do things around here. And that cultural definition is like you, you're a fish swimming in a bowl. It's not actionable. We believe that culture is defined by how our relationships are structured with each other how we treat each other, how we treat patients, how we treat our community. And that definition is very actionable. That means that everyone can participate in allowing a new culture to emerge. And so really culture will emerge based on all the interactions in all those relationships. So that means that relationships have to become very, very important even at the strategic level. And so prioritizing relational things at the strategic level is interesting, right? Because there's not really good definitions of culture. You have to use proxy measures, right? You have to use, if people are afraid, 
um, if people don't feel their manager listens to them, if patients fear retribution, um, if you know the community thinks that you're paternalistic and not a partner. And all of this kind of shifting gets you to the place where the culture can achieve the results that you want. So there's a whole bunch of research around what happens in hierarchical fear-based cultures. You can't innovate, um, you don't have good quality, you don't have great patient experience, team members are stressed. And so you have to kind of go where those structures are and just dismantle them strategically through how you set goals, how you do your work, how you how you do leadership development, how you do HR processes, what your policies look like. And so you really have to start that kind of dismantling so that new culture can emerge. And to be honest with you, this conversation, I think, is where healthcare organizations sometimes fail, 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 especially when it comes to the patient experience. Because I, we really believe at Vidant, and I strongly believe that patient experience is a lagging indicator that you will never have great, authentic patient relationships and, exper and positive experiences unless you have team members who feel cared for and valued and are engaged. So most of the work I did in the first two or three years that I was here was focused on team members, love, empathy, and bringing those elements into the relationships so that that new loving culture could emerge. How are you helping people look through this lens of love and do all of these other things <laughs> that institutionally we want our, our institutions to be stalwarts, you know, steady, yeah. strong? Like <laughs> This is the best question, John. It really is because I think First of all, um, my position reports directly to the system CEO. When I was hired, I was very clear that I, there was a strategy that I wanted to, to do this work. And we started with the board. And there is science behind a lot of the work we do about taking fear out of an organization and, and empathy as a absolute must have for not only patient experience, but your own well being. And so I used a lot of the science, but at the end of the day, that won't do it because you can dismiss science as we now have found out. Mm -hmm. But we really talked about our communities and about what does love really mean and how important is love in keeping a population healthy and keeping your family members healthy and well. And we started at the board and we just started working our way down. And I would say, and I think, I think when I first started, my CFO said to me, <laughs> I love him so much. He said, you can't put butterflies on your board presentation. I said, what, Who, whose rule is that? They're transformational and they're beautiful. And he's like, it's not gonna go well. And I said, everyone loves butterflies. <laughs> and I think it's just about being brave mm -hmm. and talking to people about things they do really care about. Um, everyone wants to feel love and have a great partnership. I designed for the first two years with an intention of love. So if it didn't feel loving, I just would not do it. And and that was that was fascinating to the team. And also when I told the board that we were gonna be doing some empathy salons, some gratitude, hearts and minds work to prepare the culture. And it was only gonna be done through attraction. They said, no one's gonna come. And I said, if I make it beautiful, they will come. Nope, nope, you'll have to mandate it. I said, nobody mandates hearts and minds. And so we designed these beautiful salons and they were full constantly because healthcare's hungry, healthcare's hungry. So I think it was just some bravery and then the support of the team. You said something to me the other day about the innovation happens in desperation. And that was us, right? They, mm -hmm. they had low trust communities Vidant was trying to grow and be a system. We were struggling. And so how was all that stoic power over stuff working for people? And people were like, it's not working for us. I said, well, how about love and empathy? Because love works almost all the time. Can't go wrong. And I think I was, I was so happy 
it had been maybe the first year I was here, one of our presidents, he got up on stage during the service awards and he shouted out to 1,100 team members, I love y'all. And the, and the crowd exploded. And then that's just reaffirming. It's just reaffirming. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think if you add glitter to anything, <laughs> there are a couple of words that I want you to say more about. You talk about fear-based organizations, and um, you you in your work spend a lot of time talking about <clears throat> power over and power with. And when we talk about fear-based organizations, you gave some really good examples of what that sounds like, what it talks like, what it feels like. Can you give a distinction between a power over and a power with environment and culture? Yes. Healthcare is not transactional. It's a relationship. And I loved that article um, that really changed a lot. It really influenced me was from the triple aim to the quadruple aim that, you know, we had the triple aim and IHI said, work on these three aims. And then everybody said, oh, we can't achieve those aims unless we have the well-being of our workforce. And um, I think in that article, it said that um, healthcare is a relationship and it's only effective if it's um, symbiotic and benefits both parties so both can thrive. So in a power over culture, you usually have in within the relationships, fear, hierarchy, all the isms live in power over cultures, racism, racism, genderism, ageism, favoritism all the isms that make someone think they're more or less important than someone else. Um, You usually have judgment, you know, judgmentalism, which is, you know, the antithesis of empathy. And so when the relationships silos, we versus us versus them, fear is my big one. You know, if you're afraid, um, you're never gonna have innovation if you're afraid. And so in power over cultures, the relationships have too much of that in them versus power with cultures, which are more partnership based. And they have a lot of empathy. They have shared decision making. They have collaboration. They have joy. They have gratitude. But here's the fascinating, the fascinating piece of all of this is it is very clear in the science that one type of culture begets certain things and one type of culture doesn't. And So in a power with culture, you get a lot of innovation, you get a lot of empathy, compassion, you usually have good mentorship, you usually have good um, talent management, you have shared decision making, and great patient experiences, great quality outcomes, because people aren't afraid to report near misses. So that culture will deliver results that everyone in healthcare wants go deep down into the organization. And if you have too much fear and hierarchy, you probably are not able to achieve the results that you want and the consistency that you want. You make a really important point here about the power over. And I think a really good example on this is near misses and near miss reporting. How will we ever learn in a system type of fashion where things go right and go wrong so that we can make things safer and we can improve the quality. Well, I think, and and thank you for saying that about quality, because one of the results that we're very proud of is the question in our AHRQ safety survey of punitive response to error just improves over and over. Again, you will not get innovation if you don't innovate your goals. Um, our goals this year, our strategic goals are rocking and they're, <laughs> they're gonna help us get better. Our quality goal is to increase the reporting for near misses. So we are serious about creating that safety and having people look to keep everybody safe. I always talk about levers you can pull because you can't use a hierarchical approach to get to power with. So you can't, you know, you can't do with a stick. I think the first thing is to look at your leadership development. Now, when I came to Vidant, our leadership development was very traditional. And I thought it it was transactional and not full of love and kindness and mentorship. So we actually designed our own. And I have a memory. I called our CEO and I, I had these, all these books sitting around me, you know, like your your scholarly. And I mean, I have a I have a doctorate in leadership and innovation, right? So I'm looking at all these different 
models. And I'm like, put my head in my hands. And I'm like, none of these are going to take us where we want to go. We're going to have to develop our own leadership curriculum and our own leadership framework. So I called our CEO and I said, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to build it. And I just, there was silence on the phone because he knows what kind of work that is. But then we got everybody together and we got all these different frameworks together and we designed something that was for Vidant that would take us where we wanted to go. So leadership development is so important because the leaders at the top of the hierarchy, if they are perpetuating fear or dominance, whether intentional or not, because some leaders were just taught, then that that has to shift, right? A new leadership way of being has to emerge. So that's the first thing. The other thing is HR, which I have a totally tight process with our HR partners um, and with our CHRO. You have to look at policies and procedures. Are your policies by their nature punitive? How do you handle mistakes and coaching and errors with your team members? Do you have grace when they are humanly failing? Do you have grace for their, you know, their mental health issues? So really have to dismantle that. We did a lot of work with policies. It's, it's amazing how many policies, once you read them with a lens of caring and love, you're like, well, this is terrible. Why would we have this policy? And then I think marketing and communications was amazing, right? Because you can market and communicate the way you want your culture to be. You can use communications around gratitude and love and caring. You can use stories. And then the last thing I would say is that we did salon with people, which I talked about earlier. And we had explorations of empathy where people would just, they would just come in about 45 people. And we'd talk about why is empathy important? And we do story circle and we talk about Brene Brown and we'd look at, we do reflections and it really let people loosen up from that that culture that you mentioned that kind of stoic and results driven to say yeah empathy is really important this is important to me i like talking about this so i think those are some of the you know the levers that we pulled to to kind of help that new culture emerge at the strategic level so in these salons and you're uh, referring to this is your approach to leadership. You've brought all of your teams in to uh, contribute and figure out how, what's, what's the right way for Biden to build leadership. So empathy, gratitude, thank you notes. This was really not the playbook that most people were using for preparing for a disaster. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that, Julie, but um, so, so as you've been building this culture and this leadership, how does that prepare you as an organization, as team, as system, as individuals to respond to the worst crisis, public health crisis that we have seen in a hundred years? Yeah, that's, you know, I've reflected on this a lot. I think preparing the culture for well-being and wellness and for at least acknowledging and thinking about gratitude and empathy going into the pandemic served us really well. A couple things. They were used to um, mindfulness, little meditation thrown in. So when we really started offering things, it wasn't like, hey, I don't need that, right? And because they were used to designing with us and giving us feedback, they would lean in when they needed something. So I think just the whole, the whole concept of getting the teams together and having them talk about empathy brought into our ability to maintain resilience in the beginning of the pandemic. And innovation takes an enormous amount of trust. Um, the mm -hmm. power dynamic makes a huge difference. We've all had to innovate at pandemic pace. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that, um, some examples of having this organizational structure, having this type of a culture, what are some of the innovations and, and how did it help you to do it in a timely manner? I think the things I think about is how we transition some of the empathy and love into how we responded to our communities. So here we are, the pandemic is upon us. 
we need to reach low trust communities in rural areas to tell them about masking, how to keep them safe, educate them about COVID, and then eventually how to get vaccinated. And we hadn't really understood, I don't think, how to reach low trust communities. So we tried uh, so many things. One of the ways is that we did it through our team members, right? We'd gather our EVS and food service workers and give them a package of masks, hand sanitizer, and say, here, take this home. These are information um, for your family. And now we always do through our team members. They can be very activated, especially when it's about their families and their communities. And we thought about how do you, with empathy, lean in to get this work done and listen? So we just started asking them. And they, they, they gave us such great advisement. One of the things that sticks out to me when we were thinking about this was we were trying to get people signed up to have a COVID vaccine. And you remember what the nation looked like, people standing in long lines, people yeah. crying, phone you lines couldn't jammed. get their appointments. Yeah. And, and I was like, we're, we cannot. We cannot create more distrust. So we said, what, what could we do? Well, we took iPads and we put the link to schedule vaccines like the people on the telephone are supposed to be doing, like only your team members can do because that's the only safe way and your IT department's losing their mind. And we just gave them to our faith-based leaders. I'm like, here, sign people up. And then we figured out we could just put that widget, that's what we called the scheduling module. We could just put it on people's phones. So like, I was talking to my hairdresser one day. She's like 24. She uh, speaks Spanish. She's got a Latina background. She's like, I would love to help get my community vaccinated. I said, well, here, I'll put this link on your phone. You can go and schedule. You can schedule people's appointments. And she scheduled like 50 appointments. Wow. And so we just, we just let the community talk to us. People would say, can you make me flyers to put on doors in our communities? And we're like, yes. What do you want them to say? What do you think will compel people to get vaccinated? And so again, we transitioned kind of that listening, design thinking, right? Empathy for the end user, define it, ideate, test it, test it. And we just tried everything we could think of. The word that you used earlier, policy, we don't spend enough time on that. And you, you know, your, your framing of looking at policies through the lens of kindness, empathy, love. And when we read the policies, what I feel is they make me fearful. They make me worried and nervous and, um, and afraid. It does stifle experimentation, trying new things, taking certain levels of risks and learning from it. So I can imagine, <laughs> hear what the policies say. There's a really good reason why they're in place. Okay, Julie, I'm the IT guys. Like you're giving out our iPads and how's our data secure? Um, how? I know. Okay, so how do you make that business case between um, keeping our community safe, trying new things, and the risk of not doing anything? So policies were designed by us. And so we can also design new policies. And many policies that were meant to keep us safe 20 years ago that are legacy are no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. And what I would say about our IT department, who I loved, who was at our elbow every step of the way, is they could solve that for us. Mm -hmm. So I said, we want the ability for anyone to schedule directly into our scheduling module. Whoa. And I said, what if we set aside appointments so they couldn't schedule all of them and we created a a widget. So they under, they know how to do that. They're brilliant. And so it's really about designing with people and yeah. the people in control of that policy in the right environment can help see that that policy is no longer relevant for the needs of keeping people safe. Like, yes, we 10 years ago would never allow anyone to schedule directly into our widget if we even had one 10 years ago, but now we have fail safes and our brilliant IT people can figure that out. And, and even in the midst of sadness, we kept saying, never waste a good crisis. Yeah. We learned so much about how to use our electronic health record and how to use that scheduling widget. So now we can let people schedule screening exams. But again, that was because we had to partner with the person who had ownership of that. So we all had to be there together. It takes everybody. Here's an idea, but I don't quite know how to make it safe, but I bet you do. And so how are we going to make this happen? 
and the learnings are going to help us with our low trust communities forevermore. So there are several reports that are coming out at this moment in time talking about the future of nursing. The pandemic has produced a lot of um, inward uh, analysis, and they all have important recommendations that we need to be taking a look at. Um, And across them, the thing that I find consistent is that we need to rethink care delivery. We need to think, rethink organizational structures so that it does facilitate this innovation. And we need to have different payment models that are going to incentivize um, a better outcome, better health, better experience. So you're in the thick of this. You're seeing all these different things flying at you. How are you and your teams, um, your leaders, your business operations, how are you using these reports, your own experience, the recommendations to catalyze innovation for what we need to do next? What I have seen a lot in what's being reported is that nursing um, has a unique opportunity to innovate because they are innovative and think differently by nature. We are launching our first nurse innovation lab with our our experienced designer, who's a design architect with human centered design, and get people who have a holistic view and who can strategically think through complex, wicked problems. And I actually think that's nursing. Nurses are uniquely qualified and capable of innovation. Ask any nurse how many prototypes she's created from a glove or a medicine cup or a piece of tape. But they're also uniquely qualified and uniquely talented to looking at complex problems in a holistic way. So we're taught to assess a piece, but be mindful, ever mindful of the whole. I think that a lot of those reports are finally putting nursing in the place to say, let them drive, let them innovate, give them an environment where they can do what needs to be done to take healthcare in a new direction. And they can do it with love and empathy and joy and hope, as well as having the technical and scientific expertise, because that's the beauty of nursing, right? It's, it's a heart job, but it's a science job. It's yeah. an everything job. Well, that, that's what that's what's fun about it. it. You get to be in the midst of the mess and the magic. <laughs> that's um, so good. And, you know, and, and the mystery, I think, is the other part, too. Yeah. Uh, you have this concept that organizations need to be disruptive in their strategic layers. What do you mean by that? Well, just like we talked about with policy, my very humble, learned opinion is that a lot of times when people are talking about culture transformation or transformational change, they want to lay it on top of structures that will never allow it to gain traction. You can't have a loving culture if your policies around how you deal with medication errors is punitive. You can't have all the outcomes of a loving culture if your marketing and communications is still very tactical and not full of that love and joy. So I think disrupting the strategy and operationalizing the culture you want in a different way is the way for it to be able to emerge from the bottom. The other mm-hmm. thing I will say very, in a very sassy manner is that you don't need other people to help you with your culture. Do you know you have innovators sitting around in your hospital? They're everywhere. Your EVS and food service workers will redesign your food delivery in a hot minute. Don't bother to pay money for a consultant. Your innovation awaits you if you walk into your departments. Every nurse knows how to make their work environment better. They live it. Humans are so clever. Let people design for people and they'll do it. Give them an environment and ask them, listen, they'll design beautiful things. Another common theme that comes out of all of these really important reports is the need for diversity in (laughs) our workforce. So how are you thinking about building through your strategic layer and power of people and innovating there. How are you achieving uh, diversity in your workforce? You know, I think it again starts internally. And so we do a variety of things related to recruitment that are very relational. We do these clinic pop-ups that we learned in the pandemic 
health fairs are kind of oh so gone, right? Because nobody wants you to assess their health anymore. Uh, they don't want you to tell them to take medicines they can't afford and food they can't afford to eat. And so we do these clinic pop-ups, which are just like community says, bring us what we need and we pop it up a clinic, which whatever they need. And we always bring a recruitment person. So we actually give people jobs, which is what our communities want. So we hire right out of these community events. And then as soon as our entry level workers get here, we say, what else would you like to be? What else would you dream of doing? Do you want to be a nurse perhaps? Because I really need about a million of those. So how about nursing school? How about nursing assistant school? So we do a lot of really relational recruitment right from our low trust communities. This, this is the best. So we recruit from a variety of areas and our team members in talent discovered this young girl. She was in the line at the homeless shelter. She had been in foster care her whole life. She was working at Dunkin Donuts, but she didn't have enough money to get out of the, to get out of the homeless shelter. And so our team said, well, we'll go in and they got her a job in food service. And this is kind of the empathy part, right? So she didn't have a car and she's still at the homeless shelter. So someone from food service picked her up every day and dropped her off. Well, she had a full-time job, so she couldn't stay at the homeless shelter anymore. So everybody rallied and got her an apartment. And uh, we worked on that, all of us did. And then um, she got the apartment and People from all over donated things so she didn't have to come home on her first day to an empty department. And she just um, was signed up for nursing assistant certification, which we pay for. And she's going to grow up and be a Vidant nurse. And, you know, a hundred of those stories adds to the diversity of the workforce, the loyalty of the workforce, and actually the beauty of the relationships because caring for others and having gratitude for others is part of the cultural fabric that we really want to perpetuate. Yeah. Putting resources to people and putting resources to build out your workforce should be key for everyone right now in healthcare. So like us, we have a homegrown program. So if you want to be a nurse, you work in EVS or food service, we work with you, make it possible for you financially, work schedule to become a nurse. So a lot of the interpreters go back to school and be nurses. Mm -hmm. And then we have bilingual nurses. They probably wouldn't be able to do that unless we helped them. Is it a costly program? Yes. And we now have lifetime nurses that are deeply loyal to Vidant. And so I think some of that thinking could help people looking at the long term, especially now with the workforce shortage that we yeah. have. I'm very focused on our EVS and food service, which about 60% of our EVS and food service workers are African American women. I'm very focused on helping them with their dreams. So they all have leadership development if they want it. If they tell me they want to go to medical school, we're working on it. They want to be a lab tech. We got you. And so I'm very focused on that. And I would say I'm focused on it from a humanitarian standpoint, but also just the realities of the workforce. Yeah. You know, in a town of 90,000, how are we, every hospital, going to staff itself in the next two years? We have people in the community. If we're a good environment with a great culture and we love them, they will work for us and they will be loyal to us and they will take care of their community. So this whole workforce advancement concept is something that I would wish all healthcare organizations would pivot to with great intention. You, you know, you said do that a hundred more times. How do you operationalize this approach to love and empathy? And then how do you scale it? Because that's pretty intensive with a lot of resources and efforts on one person. How do you make sure that the, the hundreds of people that show up that way, that you can still customize and personalize it but also operationalize and scale it. You empower people at every level to do what their heart tells them to do for the good of the organization. So I didn't, I didn't ask our talent person to go to the homeless shelter and, and meet this young girl. I didn't tell them that, um, you know, that they didn't have to get permission to help with a hotel. 
I didn't know they were picking her back up and work. It's not, you know, it's not from me. It's from that culture of empathy and caring. What if, you know, all the, all, all the high school children saw how amazing it is to be a nurse or a lab tech or a food service worker or a chef. You know, we have a chef program. Our chef right now, Matt Biden, he, our head chef started as a dishwasher. Mm. Now he's but, our head chef. Um, what you're describing is not a cost. This is an investment. Totally. What are one or two immediate things that people could do within their organizations to change the tone or flatten that internal hierarchy? I would say that executives, anyone who wants to flatten the hierarchy or get with their teams and innovators should just go listen. Mm. And they should listen and they should listen and they should listen and then they should listen. Um, some too many times we think we know what people want, which makes an executive team appear tone deaf. We don't understand their lived their lived experience, what their emotions are. So that's my first my first suggestion. It so seems like it would be so easy, but it is not common for people to have listening channels for team members. The other thing I would say is that work on work on well being and do what the team members tell you they need, not what you think they need. Um, when the pandemic hit, we put in tranquility rooms and they were beautiful and they were just designed for the pandemic, right? A single station, 20, 20 different stations. Um, but then we heard, you know, that's a nice tranquility room, but I can't get there. I work in the ICU. So then we, did tranquility to go when people were leaving that day. We moved the tranquility room up into their break room. And then people were like, the tranquility rooms aren't enough. You know, I'm sad. And so we designed these well-being pop-ups. And then we then we found out too, the nurses weren't going to tell us, the doctors weren't going to tell us that they were having mental health issues. That's not safe, right? Mm -mm. So we designed these well-being pop-ups and our medical director, who's an integrative medicine doc, would go up on the floors with like a spa kit. Okay, this is this is this is design trickery. And you could get this beautiful spa kit that's got like those that that little thing that you can put over your eyes and face when Eye you mask, have masks yeah. or yeah, you put in the refrigerator and like designer chocolates and and you know tips for meditations. And it looks like a spa, it's all wrapped up, it's beautiful. You could pick it up in the lounge, but then guess who's sitting there, right? Um Dr. Bowen and someone from EAP, and they're like, Hey, how are you doing? You sleeping okay? How are you eating? How's it going at home? And did this really safe and light well-being assessment? And we had so many interventions from that. And then now, deeper in to the pandemic, there's other things that the team members want and need. They were burned out again and they said, well, you know, I go home and I don't feel like cooking. All right, I'll bring food trucks in at change of shift. Pick up food trucks, let everybody take meals home. So it's one size fits one for mm -hmm. wellness, but I think those demonstrations of kindness and love for the people that are trying so hard right now um, softens that hierarchy. And then people will trust you and they will know that you care about them. And then, then what comes from that is people telling you, hey, here's my idea. Was there anything that you wanted to share that I didn't surface in our conversation. I want to send my gratitude and love to everyone in healthcare that has worked so hard in this pandemic. Never waste a good crisis, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been sad or worried or afraid. So I want to send love and gratitude to everyone. And then I want to give a quote from one of my mentors, Teddy Potter, and she used to say very kindly to me when things were very chaotic, she'd say very gently in that beautiful, sweet voice, Julie, sometimes things have to disassemble before they reassemble. And that gives me some peace because healthcare is disassembling, but it's only disassembling so we can reassemble it in a much better, more loving, more caring way that is exactly where we need to head for healthcare to be what we need it to be for our future. I feel 
really nurtured by this conversation. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that those who are listening will feel that same warmth and being attended to that I do because the quality of your voice, the nature of your listening, your desire to care, to love, to understand comes through um, very powerfully. And so I know it's been really good for me and I hope that as others listen, that they will feel that same way. And I wanna just thank you for inviting me. I think that sometimes innovation gets stuck in prototypes of tools and other things, but I think relational innovation and cultural innovation is fascinating. I'll be a student of it my whole life. And so I just appreciate you giving me space to share a little bit, but also to um, give me some questions that I can think further on. I, I love it when I can say, I don't really know, because then as soon as I say it, then I'm going to ask a bunch of people and then I'm going to like go down the rabbit hole of, I got to figure that out or I got to be cu more curious. And so um, it's been great. And I just, I just really appreciate you uh, listening to this, uh, what's love got to do with an innovation, which uh, for some people they're like, whoa, what on earth is that? So <laughs> yeah, so I thank Q, you. Q and Tina Turner on that. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> Everything. Um, <laughs> with love, joy, and butterflies, nurse executive Julie Kennedy Aylert serves as the chief experience officer for Vident Health in Eastern North Carolina, a rural part of the country whose big personality, diversity, and unique community vibes caught her by surprise in the best possible way. In that heart science curiosity role, she's creating healthy and healing experiences for patients, team members, and the community. In pretty much any setting, Vident patients and team members access healthcare or health information, which might be a pop-up clinic, at a food truck, on a pastor's mobile phone, or in an empathy salon. In her role, Julie is also helping people follow their dreams, feel safe and empowered to share their oh-so-clever transformational ideas and act on their charitable instincts in building a diverse and representative workforce. When the Institute for Healthcare Improvement introduced the Triple Aim, it quickly spread and was adopted by health systems across the country for optimizing system performance along three aims of improving the health of our populations, enhancing patient care experience, and reducing the costs of care. As health teams around the country adopted the Triple Aim framework, there was a growing awareness, science and data, suggesting the importance of a fourth aim that of well-being of our healthcare workforce. And so the triple aim became the quadruple aim, and along with it, an appreciation that healthcare, as Julie quotes, is a relationship between those who provide care and those who seek care, a relationship that can only thrive if it is symbiotic and benefiting both parties. And Julie has baptized herself in this belief and expresses it with love, joy, and empathy in her design work, data analysis, leadership and talent development, actually in everything she does. As she says, if it didn't feel loving, I just would not do it. At Vident Health, they're building and sustaining a culture that talks about what love really means and how important is love in keeping a population healthy and keeping your family members healthy and well. And if you ask the team at Biden Health, what love's got to do with improving health outcomes, patient experience, safety, quality, team engagement, well-being, curiosity, and innovation, they'll shout it out. Everything. In case you missed it, be sure to listen and share the earlier episodes in our Reporting Power series, where we dig into the ambitious nature of the recent reports of significance impacting healthcare and nursing. Embark on a listening adventure of beautifully told stories, revealing how the pandemic changed access to care, changed care needs, and impacted the well-being of the healthcare workforce. And immerse ourselves 
with conversations from innovators who help us gain a better understanding of just how nurses are accelerating nursing and transforming healthcare. And this brings us to the close of our Reporting Power series this listening season and yet another year that has tried and tested us. The See You Now team is wildly grateful for your enthusiastic listening and support for the stories of how nurses are leading innovation, improving health, saving lives, and yes, keeping entire health systems working safely. The See You Now stories and innovators are powerful evidence that even in our most difficult and uncertain hours, productive change, transformational change, and exceptional equitable results are possible. It's an important lesson that we can take into the new year. Wishing you and your loved ones a happy, healthy, vaccinated holiday season. And in the new year, we'll return with new stories. From all of us at See You Now, may there be peace on earth and goodwill toward all. I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.